Thank you, Julian. Our fifth, fifth story, uh, which will be the last one of the first half, um, should be Points to the Eye by Daniel Goodin. Daniel was born in 1984 and grew up in Longwell Green in South Gloucestershire. He works as a library assistant at the University of Bristol and moonlights as a film and television extra. And, he says, gets paid bugger all to stand around for hours, dressed like a pillock, eating fistfuls of cake in a futile attempt to keep warm. <laughs> yeah, that's a brain shit for you, isn't it? <laughs> Sadly... <laughs> Sadly, Daniel cannot be with us this evening, and uh, he's you know, very sad about that, as well as we are. So, what I thought I'd do is try and find somebody else who was born in 1984 to read the story, but I couldn't find anybody. <laughs> So I found somebody born in 1985 instead. So, to read Points to the Eye by Daniel Gooding, please welcome to the stage, Ed Holland. <laughs> the dead man lay flat on his back, arms flung out as though he were throwing a tantrum. From the accounts of various eyewitnesses, the man had just been standing there, looking at a painting, perhaps more attentively than most, when they had suddenly heard a horrible wailing noise. Blood curdling was the unimaginative consensus. Strangely enough, no one had actually seen the victim at the critical moment, or even been near him, all seeming to pass through various archways to adjoining rooms just as the incident occurred. The only thing anyone seemed to remember was turning around abruptly to see the man stagger into the middle of the room with great jagged steps and hands on head in true old school horror fashion before falling lifeless to the ground. Inspector Cadden knew the place well. Having lived in the area his whole life, he had, he had passed many afternoons as a child here in the city's museum and art gallery. Most of the paintings and sculptures were ones that had always been there, which somehow made them seem older than the fact that they were being created over a hundred years ago. He remembered one sculpture in particular, although not the name of the artist, or even much of what it looked like. Just some sort of suspended arrangement involving a triangle aimed arrow-like at a pale sphere. The only thing he could recall was the name of the piece, points to the eye, and the fact that it was supposed to represent the triumph of life over death, or something. While other officers were busy sealing the main doors in the lobby, some of them talking to the reception staff, and the manager was doing his best to look stoic in the face of everything that was suddenly happening to him. Cadden's job was to guard the body. With nobody else around, this required little effort on his part. And so he wandered slowly around the room, looking at the pieces again, some of which he had not seen for years. The points to the eye sculpture wasn't there, but then perhaps it had simply been on loan from another gallery. Then again, it just might be in another room upstairs. He turned around to make a perfunctory check. The unidentified figure peered back at him down the length of his body. This wasn't the first time Cadden had seen a dead body, nor the first time he had been left alone with one. But he never felt this particular unease before. He told himself he was just imagining things. But at the same time he knew, from the way the eyes glinted, that they were pointed in his direction. Perhaps the killer had stood where he was standing now. He moved around the room slowly, giving each painting an equally appreciative glance, until he came to one in the far corner. This one he remembered well. It was dated from 1616, 
and showed an obviously well-born mother in bed, holding her two infant sons. Presumably the idea was that the twins had just been born, and yet despite this the woman was shown in full Elizabethan costume. Not only that, the two twins seemed also to be swaddled in material cut from the same pattern. He felt the same reaction to this picture as he had done many times as a child, imagining how sweaty and uncomfortable she must have been in that get-up combined with the heavy bedclothes and the numerous candles lighting the room. He reminded himself that the woman would have been given the garb in the picture to protect her modesty, but even so, he couldn't help thinking about the residual horrors of childbirth that lie beneath those sheets, staining the already musty fabric. He heard a noise behind him, like the sound of a child stifling a giggle. Turning round, he couldn't see anything, nor any sign of life from the raised walkways above. He glanced again towards the body. The eyes were looking straight at him. Decidedly unnerved now, he took a step closer to make sure. The eyes were definitely staring right at him, although neither the head nor any other part of the body had moved. He took one step to the side, then two more in quick succession. The eyes remained locked on his, seemingly unmoving, and yet following him around the room. Captain shook his head, went back to the painting. He looked at the matching expressions of the children, identical with the vacant stare of their mother, he realised that of the two babies, the one on the left was somehow fainter than the other. The colour and the detail on the face and the blanket were faded, even though the rest of the painting seemed fine. It was as though that particular baby had been exposed to sunlight for a long period of time, when the rest of the picture had been kept in darkness. Adam heard a scuffling sound from the doorway, the squeak of soles on wooden floor. He turned his head, expecting to see Richards come through the archway, but nobody was there. He looked around again for another quick check on the body. It was gone. He turned around in complete circle and immediately felt stupid. Then he heard it again, the sound of a child suppressing laughter, only louder this time. He looked up again towards the balconies that overlooked the main gallery. Suddenly there was a harsh guffawing from the opposite side of the room. This time it sounded like an adult, but there was something forced and unnatural about the noise, as though there were a person was trying to laugh for the very first time. There was a loud, stilted, clumping noise, and Cadden turned to face the opposite walkway, just in time to see a figure of some sort lolloping out of sight behind a pillar. There was something horrible about the way it was moving, as if it wasn't used to those legs. Cadden felt his own legs growing equally unstable, and felt like fleeing the room, but thought he would merely stumble and fall if he tried. He thought of reaching for his radio. Of course, that's what he should be doing, for Christ's sake. But any movement would only draw attention to himself, though from whom or what he didn't want to think about. Instead, he turned slowly back to the painting. He looked at the faded infant and the brighter one alongside. The latter one now seemed to glow in comparison, throbbing imperceptibly. Despite Cadden's terror of moving, he thought something in the painting would be able to help him provide some sort of answer. Slowly, he moved towards the portrait, trying to keep the rest of his body as motionless as possible as his legs pulled him towards the canvas. He looked at the brighter child. The eyes were staring directly at him. And yet, as his own eyes moved minutely around the small figure, its gaze seemed to flick aside in similar fashion, as though trying to indicate something to him. He turned to look in the same direction, but could see nothing different. Another peculiar slapping of feet came from upstairs, but further away this time. He looked again at the child's face. 
The eyes were definitely staring in that one direction, but not quite from the same angle. Captain gingerly stepped over the thin black line of cord that guarded the painting, half expecting an alarm to be triggered somewhere. He stood as close to the canvas as he dared, and turned again to face where the infant seemed to be pointing. Still seeing nothing, he crouched down to the height of the child's head. He felt a faint movement in the air, like the billowing of a musty curtain. The museum smell suddenly intensified as two tiny ice-cold hands covered his eyes, his own screams distorted in his mind by the newborn-like crying that seemed to drown them out. He ran forward, immediately stumbling over the dividing cord line and falling face first to the ground. He felt the impact of his head striking the wooden floor. But before the pen could register, he had already been tuned out, like a television turned down quick, quickly at a loud part of the film. It looked through the new glassy eyes at the strangely black Cadillac figures running into the room. He now peered down at the new body and pressed fingers against its neck. Still trying not to giggle, he stretched out its new body and lay down to wait. To wait for the funny man to leave so it could go and find its brother.